Welcome to the Growth Zone. I am Christian Bartsch and I have a really interesting session for you today. I've got today with me Carl Allen. He's based in the UK, does business as well in the US. Canada, other parts of Europe, and so on. So we'll be discussing different topics about buying or selling small businesses. I'll give you just a quick short introduction who Carl Allen is. Carl is a world-class entrepreneur, investor, and corporate dealmaker who has worked on more than 330 transactions worth close to $48 billion. In his nearly 30-year career, Carl Allen has analyzed thousands of businesses, big and small, in 17 different countries across nearly every business sector, including technology, pharmaceuticals, transport and logistics, engineering, manufacturing, aerospace, consumer goods and services, business services, retail, professional services, finance, packaging and corporate clothing. So what I'll be discussing with Carl, uh, we have following four questions for him. What is the value of buying a business rather than starting one? What criteria do you recommend people to have when they are deciding what kind of business to buy? How much of buying a small business is based on psychology versus numbers? and how his side activities help him as well to personally grow. So these topics we will be discussing with Carl. And yeah, that's it. So I've got with me Carl Allen today. And yeah. Carl, I think you're based at the moment in UK, thanks to all the things that are happening in the world. Would you please tell us a bit more about yourself? Yeah, so Christian, thanks so much for having me on the show. So I'm I'm based uh, near Manchester, England. Uh, I normally spend 50% of my time on the east coast of the United States. I co-own a private equity firm um, over there, and we, we buy and sell lots of different businesses. So I've been a deal maker for 28 years this coming July. So I started my career in the investment banking world. Uh, I also worked in corporate mergers and acquisitions, did all that until 2008. Then I started buying and selling my own small businesses. And then about four years ago, I started, in addition to continuing to buy and sell businesses, I started coaching and mentoring entrepreneurs and existing business owners how to acquire small businesses in quite a lot of different countries and how to acquire those businesses using other people's capital other people's investing so that's what i do in my in my corporate world so on the one hand I, i'm coaching and on the other hand I, i'm eating my own cooking if you will i'm buying and selling my own businesses as well and then in, in my personal life, I, I'm married. I have two children. Um, I have a 23-year-old who lives in Australia. Uh, he's, a, he's an IT uh, developer. And then I have a 12-year-old son who lives with me and my wife in, uh, in a house in the, in the Lancashire countryside. Um, don't really have a lot of hobbies, uh, if I'm being honest. I spend a lot of time with my family. Uh, obviously, the last four months, whilst it's been challenging, I would say, being locked down in the UK, I've had some wonderful times um, stuck in the countryside with my family, and it's been uh, it, it's been wonderful. Yeah, I agree. That's the advantage of uh, even of situations like lockdowns, where we can uh, take some time and maybe to reflect, do some other work that we otherwise wouldn't be able to do because we may be commuting and having all other kind of stuff to do. And that's a great, as you said, it's a great time as well to maybe step down one moment and then just think about new stuff that you can do and build up complete new momentum and that. And that brings me actually to uh, my first question that I've got for you. And that is, what is the value of buying businesses rather than starting one? 
Okay, great. So that's a really, really good question. And I'm, I'm going to answer that in three parts. So the first part is I'll, I'll give you some market data. So if you take the United States, because it's the largest country of entrepreneurs and, and, and businesses available, if you look at the U.S., almost 7 million entrepreneurs every year start a brand new company. And whether you listen to Tony Robbins or Michael Gerber or Grant Cardone or Forbes or the Wall Street Journal, they'll all tell you that 96% of those businesses, those new businesses, will not survive 10 years. So only 4% of those companies actually survive a 10-year period. So one in 25 and 50%, 50 50% of those companies don't even survive the first 12 months. So starting a company from scratch is very, very risky. It's very risky on health. It's very risky financially. It's very risky on relationships. But but so many people do it, and, and they do it because – they, they get the entrepreneurial itch. Um, they you know don't like working for other people. They want the freedom and the pride and the wealth creation and the legacy that one typically gets when you're a business owner, when you're an employer versus becoming an employee. But but my methodology is is a lot quicker. It's a lot easier. It's a lot cheaper, and it's a lot less stressful. Is rather than reinvent the wheel and go and start a new company. Go and buy a company that somebody else has built, is profitable, and for whatever reason, they, they want to sell that business. They either want to retire, or they're bored, or they're frustrated, or they're just turned, tired and burnt out, they're sick, What whatever the reasons are. And if you look at the US again, there's over 2.4 million small businesses for sale right now. So that's sub $5 million in annual revenues, 2.5 million. However... Only one in 11 of those businesses will sell within the first 12 months because there's a there's a big lack of qualified buyers. Buyers that A, know how to do deals, and B, know where to get the capital to be able to, to buy them. And my analogy, Christian, is a bit like owning a car. So, so I've just bought my wife a new car, just bought my wife a Range Rover, and uh, I could have done one or two things. I, I could have gone online and I could have bought all the components of the car. I could have bought the doors, the chassis, the engine, the electronics, the wheels, and then gone on YouTube, figured out how to put everything together, lay all the parts out on my driveway, and then figure out, you know, how do I build this car using all these different components? Or did I just go to the dealership, buy one that someone's already built, and finance it using Range Rover. So it's exactly the same process when it comes to business. Rather than build one from scratch, and you've only got a one in 25 chance of making it work, go and buy a business that someone's built, is profitable, and it's got all of the things inside of it that startups don't have. Because when you start a company from scratch, it's what I call the no problem. You have no customers, you have no cash, you have no credit you have no employees, you probably don't have any premises or any equipment or any um, employees, any products or services to sell. Whereas if you buy an existing company, it's got cash flow, it's got revenues, it's got customers, it's got all of the things you need. And if you want to do something truly innovative, go and buy a business that's in a similar sector. And then you can innovate from within because you'll have the employees to help you You'll have the cash flow to invest in that. You'll have the cash flow to pay yourself whilst you're doing all that innovation. And then once you've built it, you've got a stream of customers already in your business that are likely going to buy it. So for me, buying versus starting it is, is the easiest, uh, most simple discussion you know any entrepreneur can have. Yeah, absolutely. And the same thing, as you said, as well, with all these different companies, how many to survive. And I think it's the same or similar figures as well for uh, Europe. When I think of it, um, even like 10, 20 years ago, uh, the UK, for, for as compared to mainland Europe, was actually the, the country in Europe that had the highest amount of self-employed people, whether they were freelancers or had small businesses or anything. Uh, much more there because I think for, for the UK, for instance, a lot of manufacturing had already gone. 
uh, for instance, like Rove and all these other manufacturing businesses, they had gone and, and the UK started going towards services. And in countries like Germany, France and so on, we've seen that as well in the last 10 years as well happening. But many, many people are already going into freelancing. And uh, yeah, I had as well a, a time as well where I was uh, working for a uh, German Italian bank as well as an external consultant and we were I said always we were like the rats in the cellar because all the consultants we were from all different companies even um, McKinsey and so on all these different names from very no well-known names to unknown names we all sat there in the cellar all together uh, with our uh, mobile phones and everything <laughs> by the time you got home you felt like as if you had your head in the microwave yeah but actually the key thing is uh, you became aware of uh, how much more we could get moving compared to the big corporate bank that was just so busy with itself, with being bought over by the Italians, and that made a big, big impact on the mindset of the employees. But when you think of it, as you said, when you go and do the, a similar strategy by buying an existing company and then seeing how can I really get the employees to uh, believe that I'm not going to just get rid of them and hire some cheap people but actually getting them on my side and maybe even making a bigger business because maybe i've got more cash flow providing and i don't have to have all this pre-investment in the development like the car i don't have to start developing a car from scratch until i figure out how it would be a nice smart land rover <laughs> that can go across everywhere whether it's a defender or it's a discovery it doesn't matter yeah. it's it has to be it has to be usable because otherwise your wife will, will tell you <laughs> get lost with the thing mm -hmm. <laughs> it is or uh, i don't want to drive this it's not safe i can't take the kids with me <laughs> whatever age they are <laughs> it's, absolutely uh, yeah and that's the thing and, and uh, looking at that uh, what would you say is the criteria that you would recommend people to have when they're deciding what kind of business actually to buy? Yeah, so that's another really good question. And the answer to that question is, I'll tell you what the three main criteria are, but that question is going to be different for everybody. And we, I call it the perfect deal triad. So the first factor that one needs to consider is – you need to buy a business ideally in a sector that you know something about. So if you've worked for, say, IBM um, as, a, as a salesperson or as an engineer, you know, go and buy a small IT company. Or if you're an engineer, you know, go and buy a small engineering company. If you've been a web designer, go and buy a web design company. You know, don't buy a hotel or a restaurant or a laundromat. Uh, or you know, dry cleaning company. You know, buy something that you know something about. You can have a meaningful conversation with a seller. Um, it allows you to easily build relationships with those people. And buy a business in a space that you're passionate about and you can add value. Because th th there's three ways you make money doing deals. You can make money the day you close because you can raise more capital than you actually need to pay the owner of the business. So that gives you a little payout at closing. Obviously, as the owner of the business, you get the cash flow that the business generates every month. That's your income. But then where you really make the money is when you grow and you sell that business. So it, it allows you to do that more effectively if you buy a business in a sector that you know and that you understand. So that's for a first-time business owner. If, you're, if you own a business already, go and buy a business that's very complementary to what you've already got. So if you own a software company, you can either buy another software company to grow your market share, or you can buy, say, an IT services company, and then you can sell your software to the services customers and vice versa. And then when you bring those two businesses together, there's a lot of cost synergies, a lot of cost savings that you can generate when you combine the operations. So point number one is buy a business that's strategically linked to who you are. The second point then it's all about finding the right seller. So my methodology teaches people how to buy businesses without investing their own money. And the way we do that is we, we split up the purchase price into two components. So the first component is uh, we're paying the seller, in most cases, some money at closing. But we're trying to get as much of the purchase price 
into what we call seller financing. So paying the seller over time for the purchase of their business and using the business's cash flows to be able to make those payments. And that all comes down to you finding the right seller. So what you're looking for is what I term a distressed seller of a good business. So you don't want to buy a business that's in trouble, that's running out of cash, that's got some major, major problems. You don't want to do a deal like that because then you're going to be chasing your tail trying to fix that business and turn it around. Uh, Some people do that and do that very, very well. That's not my methodology. I'd rather buy a really good business and just finance the purchase. So, But you need to find a seller that's really motivated. For the reasons I mentioned before, they either want to retire or they're sick or they're frustrated or burnt out or they just run out of ideas. They have a strong motivation to want to come out of that business. And then the third point is, so once you've picked the right sector and you've found the right bunch of deals, you've got the right sellers, then really to put some financing into that deal, you want to find a business that's either profitable or has got a strong balance sheet of assets or ideally both because when that happens there's a torrent of financing available for you to go in and buy that business so um, you need to tick all the those three boxes so two and three are uh, generic to everybody but it's point number one that's going to be different depending on who you talk to so it's all about staying in your lane and buying a business in a sector that you know. Yeah, I absolutely agree, because then it's much easier you're actually knowing what you're getting yourself in. And if you're buying something that you absolutely not understand, you might even maybe over-exaggerate your expectations that what you can do, or you think, oh, yeah, it's, it's going to do this and this, and then you suddenly notice, oh, <laughs> this is happening in this business where one doesn't know anything about and the industry is like collapsing, and that's why the guy is actually trying to sell. That's why he's actually distressed and not whether he has uh, sickness or he wants to, at last he says he's now 60, wants to sell the business, go on holiday and enjoy the time that he never had with his wife and travel around and all the different other things or things that come maybe in life where they decide they want to do something different, but they, they think, I don't want just to close the business and, and just shut it down. Yeah. I've got people who have hired 30, 40, 50 years. Yeah. Uh, so I, somehow I need to find someone who I can trust to take it over uh, because they've put this well already so much hard as well into it, the hard work of building it up in the first place. Yeah, and so when you think of it, how much of buying a small business is actually based on psychology versus numbers? What yeah. would you say, Alan? Yeah, so it's um, it's about 90%. Um, mm-hmm. which you might find surprising. So when, when you're working on a very large transaction, and the largest deal that I ever did in my corporate world was just under $14 billion. It was an acquisition. Uh, Hewlett-Packard acquired a large uh, IT services company called EDS. And when you're doing deals at that level, and you're dealing with shareholders and public companies and all those different things, then really it's a game of financial engineering. When you're buying a small business, when you're buying a business that's between one and five million dollars in revenues, then it's a lot more about psychology. There are some numbers involved, of course, but it's all about building relationships and it's all about understanding the psychology and the mindset of the seller and what's truly motivating them to want to do the deal. And I discovered this back in 2008 when when I first went on my own as a deal maker, when, when I left the corporate world, uh, my original plan was to become a business broker. And business brokers, as you know, they buy and sell small businesses on behalf of their clients. So I set myself up as a business broker. And I found my first deal, it was a transportation company, which was a haulage company in the UK in Liverpool. And I was given the mandate to sell that business. And every time I took a, uh, a prospective buyer into that business, they were going to you know, close the business down and, and just take the customer base and the assets and, and, and get rid of a lot of the employees, which you touched on before. And, and a lot of sellers, about 80% of sellers, they actually don't want that. They want somebody to come in that 
that safe, trusted pair of hands that you mentioned before. And, and they want them to protect those employees and protect the customers and, and protect the legacy of the business that they've built. Because it, if you're talking to an owner manager of a business that's looking to sell and they've, you know, they've owned that business for 20 years since they started that business, they've spent more time in that business than they have with their own family. And giving that business up and retiring or moving on to someone else, often it's like giving up one of their children. Um, so they want to make sure that um, that asset, their baby, is going to somebody that's really going to care about it. So I, I figured this out that, you know, 12 years ago in 2008 because I, I, I went into buying small businesses thinking it was just like Wall Street. It was just a case of numbers and finances. And it's not at this level – there's a lot more seller psychology is involved. And so I, I would say it's as high as 90% of the entire deal process. The more time you spend building relationships with sellers, the easier it is to uh, to buy their businesses. Yeah, absolutely. It definitely makes it much easier. And uh, even if they decide to maybe uh, get rid of a certain part because they agree, okay, that's that business area isn't going to work. You can always find for those employees, you can always find some new kind of uh, job or even if uh, you've got contacts and so on, you can always help them out to move on. It doesn't mean that you have to totally get rid of them. But there are, of course, plenty of buyers who are just interested in buying, for instance, retail business and so on, and then just closing the business just to sell off the property, the real estate property. Actually, that's their key interest and it's not retail. And and if you if they never never even worked in retail, even if uh, as a kid or anything, earned their few first bucks as a thing. And and I was speaking recently to a lady who uh, does uh, forex tr uh, trading and so on, and we were conversing as well. When I started my first trading stuff, I uh, earned the money that I needed to to trade to trade shares and that uh, by working in retail yep. and that filling up shelves and so on. Whilst others were playing football, I was making my money with that. And then at the end, by the time I left school, I had quite a good uh, set of assets. Uh, so it gave me a flexibility to do certain things I wanted to do compared to others that just have to uh, make go or what, because they didn't bother on that. And that's the thing, same thing when you look at these things about business and that you, they actually do care about psychology, as you say. And, and uh, when you have conversations well with, with people have been... I was a member in a German uh, entrepreneurs association who are usually family run that give pass on the business uh, over generations. There'll always be a situation with some companies where there's no next generation. And they're thinking, I want to sell this, but it's my great grandfather set this up and it's a good brand and we've got good relationship with the employees. And then uh, you get someone who maybe buys it and then just dismantles it or yeah. just makes a terrible mess of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's the thing. The When you think of it, the seller financing, as you said, the seller has to trust that you're really going to keep paying him uh, what you agreed and not suddenly put an insolvency just to run away with <laughs> real estate or whatever. Uh, that's the thing where you have to build as well trust with them. Yeah, and so you're absolutely right. And there's, there's actually two elements to that. You know, one of them is the trust piece, the relationship piece that, that you've, you've rightly identified. The other piece, though, is, is often um, that there are legal clauses that go into the sale and purchase agreements that if um, if, if you don't, continue to make those seller financing payments, then the seller actually has the right to take the business back. Um, that That's very standard, um, mm. buying a small business, especially when there's a lot of seller financing going into the deal, uh, because that gives them the confidence uh, that for whatever reason, if you don't pay them, they, they can take the business back um, and own it again. Oh, that's that's good because that gives them at least a the security that uh, if something goes horribly wrong and they have the feeling that they can turn it around because they know the business inside out and, exp and the industry and so on and maybe the buyer isn't that who they actually claim to be then he can do something yep. but besides that so you've been doing all these different business things you've been in corporate you've been in investment and in different areas um 
how do you, um, how do you see that your side activities outside of that how do they actually help you to grow personally because i see uh, you are i think a great fan and maybe as well very active with burley fc and i see i think freemasonry and that yeah all these different things yeah so so th there are three i have three main hobbies outside of my my working life and, and my family so the first one is freemasonry so I, i've been a freemason Uh, for about three years now. So I'm 40. I'm 50 this year, so I'm 49 at the moment. Uh, so I joined Freemasonry quite late, but it's a great opportunity to kind of build a network. And it's a little bit of kind of escapism for me um, mm -hmm. when I go to meetings. And and there's a lot of charitable um, involvement in Freemasonry. And, and obviously, because I, I, I generate a lot of cash flow every year, it's nice to kind of give something back into my society to help people that, um, you know, are vulnerable or, as, uh, you know, less fortunate for me. You know, I was born into a very, you know, working class family, um, you know, nothing like the the lifestyle and the environment that, that I'm in today. Uh, and all that's come through, you know, kind of hard work and and taking my chances. But, you know, I, I, I am very philanthropic. I do like giving back. So that's my Freemasonry. Uh, Burnley's my soccer team. I'm a crazy, crazy, crazy soccer fan. And I have been um for over 40 years so my father used to take me to the games um you know i i my, you know my son when he comes back from australia my eldest son he and i go to games and obviously my my younger son and i we've got season passes um for, for burnley so i you know i've been a corporate fan i've sponsored the team in the past i've owned companies that have um interfaced with Burnley as well. I used to own the coach company that used to transport the players around. So that was a lot of fun. I used to go to all the away matches with the with the players and stay in the hotel with them, even sit on the bench, which was pretty pretty interesting. So Burnley's a big love in my life. And then what I also discovered again about three years ago is I got really heavily into personal growth. Uh, I went to a Tony Robbins seminar in London about three years ago. And since then I've invested gosh, well over $100,000 uh, with, with Tony Robbins. I'm now in his Platinum Partnership Mastermind, um, and I'm constantly learning um, to improve myself, to better myself. I've translated tons of those skills into the businesses that I own. I've translated tons of those skills into you know my own health and happiness and well-being and that of my family and my friends. Um, so, so yeah, I, I have a pretty full life, but a, but a very rich life. Um, it, it's all about the, um, the, the, you know, the, the science of achievement and the art of fulfillment. So whilst I'm achieving lots and lots of things in my life, I'm, um, I'm designed to enjoy it and, and really kind of get the full zest of life. So, uh, I'm a, I'm a generally a very, very happy individual. Yeah, we'll see because I see uh, tonight uh, Burley plays against, uh, Watford. We do. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, I I won't be going to the game because all the games now are uh, with with zero fans. So I'll be watching yeah. it. Um, it's on satellite TV, so I'll be watching it with uh, with my son. We'll uh, we'll order yeah. some pizza and um, I'll crack open a beer and uh, we'll uh, we'll watch the game. Yeah, because uh, my part of my family grew up as well in Watford, so okay. <laughs> I lived even half a year in Watford, so that'll be fun. <laughs> because the funny thing is, I lived in Watford not far actually from from the stadium where the game is going to play, if it's played in Watford. I'm not sure where they're going to have the it's match. In Burnley. It's in Burnley tonight, and Burnley's, ah. Burnley's about 15 miles from where I live in the Lancashire countryside. So, yeah, it's a home game for us tonight but um yeah what what for a good team um yeah so um what one of our old players andre gray is the striker at watford so um and i know him personally from his time mm -hmm. at burnley so uh yeah hope uh, hope it's a good game yeah because then as well on monday i think it's uh, against crystal palace and then The next Sunday against Sheffield United, which, yeah, they have lots ahead of them. <laughs> Game's coming thick and fast. They're trying to finish the season. Yeah. Good entertainment, at least especially when, when people are still locked down partly in some areas. Some maybe areas are maybe opening up. And, yeah, and it gives as well people as well maybe a good time as well to rethink 
what they want to do with their lives, yeah. especially if they are still maybe in a business working for somebody else and they decide to say, okay, I would like to go into this and this direction. And that's where they maybe are going to move by looking, okay, do I start my business? Do I take somebody else's business? And maybe there are plenty of people out there thinking, I've honestly enough, the business is working, but I want somebody who, can, who I can maybe even mentor to a certain degree to to go and join me as a junior partner in my business and eventually I can hand it over to them. Yeah. Because, of course, a certain businesses you just can't take over by night and say, okay, the other one just goes out and you're stuck there. Nobody knows uh, what's happening. You can't depend necessarily on the people who, who are working in the business. You need to transition the leadership and get as well maybe some insights and maybe get introductions by the former owner so that yep. you actually are accepted in the business. Especially if, if you're a certain age or so, maybe some business uh, suppliers and others maybe think, ah, he's not of the business, he doesn't own the industry, we don't care. <laughs> it's not going to be good or whatever. They have maybe some prejudice, which is good then, giving them people to give a chance to actually transition and gives us a, a better survival chance as well for the business as it moves on to the next generation, even the next generation has a different uh, surname. Uh, doesn't doesn't matter if it's done properly. Yeah, and that hand, handovers and transitions are a very key part of of the process. So so typically, and it all depends on the complexity of the business, I suppose. But um, you know, I've I've had handovers with sellers that have lasted a month. I've had handovers with sellers that have lasted twelve months. I've bought businesses from owners, and they've actually stayed in the businesses to manage them for me because I don't manage any of the businesses that I buy. So I'm an owner investor, not an mm -hmm. owner manager. And, and normally I'll promote somebody from within the business to take it over as the general manager. Or if there isn't anybody capable, I'll bring somebody in from my network and I'll partner with them um, as part of the deal. But what's really interesting is in some cases, a seller, they don't want the responsibility And I guess the pressure of owning the business, but they're happy to go in there every day and, and manage it for you. So, uh, you know, we have that in a number of our businesses. Mm. And when you yourself invest in businesses, do you do you have a certain industry focus where you focus on? Um, no, not now, um, because because I've done so many deals in so many different areas. I, I I've worked mm. on over three hundred and thirty transactions in my career. So. Um, and because I'm extremely well known as a business buyer, I'm a bit like the the, the Warren Buffett of, of Main Street. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm like a mini Warren Buffett. So people know my methods and my track record. So uh, that qualifies me really to, to buy any business. What I would say, though, is I would never buy a business that I don't really truly understand without partnering with somebody that does. Um, and then the only real industry that I tend to stay away from, it's not really an industry, but I, I don't typically buy business to consumer type companies. So like retail or, you know, like an Amazon um, online business or anything or a supplements business or anything like that. So I typically like to buy business to business type assets. So engineering, manufacturing, IT, construction, um, transport, freight, logistics, haulage, construction, you know, those types of businesses are really where um, where I typically buy. Yeah, I agree, because with speed to see, you always have the vulnerability that uh, the industry changes, tastes change, habits changing. And you see as well, for instance, the lockdown makes a big uh, pressure for, for retail, even though people in certain countries and certain regions are able to go again to the shops especially when you think how uh, the psychology aspect actually influences the buyer when he has to wear a mask and go in there and some masks are well-fitting, some masks are not so comfortable and people are being put off and they don't maybe like it or feel uncomfortable. And even if they have to buy, they're not going to spend as much as they would do if they would casually go in and could go as they like instead of they have to have, oh, am I not far enough from the next person? Am I going to get a fine? And all these crazy stuff happening in their mind. Uh, and when you and even if people haven't bought online, 
want to start buying one and I say, oh, this is so convenient. I know. I'm going to do all these things. For instance, my parents, uh, yeah, if there's something I need from, they need from Amazon and ask me to, to get it for them and I just order it for them and they just <laughs> send me the money later. On, or, I know. Or we, I know. We it's easier. It's, it's easy, really even though they've got Amazon as well. But yeah, for me, really it's easy. point you just made. And I, you know, it's a really mm-hmm. quick story. So one of my friends um, in the local village to me, she owns a business um, that sells like garden equipment. So mm. th- things you put in your garden. And um, she, um, you know, she was impacted quite heavily with, uh, with, with coronavirus. And she called mm. me when the lockdown was announced in the UK, so about 12, 13 weeks ago. And she said, you know, Carl, what, what am I going to do? I, I said, well, you, the only thing you can do is to pivot and to take your entire business online. Um, mm-hmm. So you can run Facebook ads, you can run Google ads, you know the email addresses of all your customers anyway, email them all and just turn your business into an online business. And so what she's done is her revenues for the past three months are up 400% year on year. And now the stores in the UK are allowed to open. She can't open because what she's done is she's turned her entire store into a fulfillment center and a warehouse for the massive amounts of volume that she's now distributing to her customers. So she's actually never going to reopen her store as a walk-in facility because she can make four times the money purely doing it online. Um, And I've seen a lot of businesses like that pivot. You know, my local Italian restaurant, um, their revenues are 300% higher than they were this time last year because, again, they moved purely to a takeout and an online delivery service. Um, So what you mentioned before about the changing in consumer behaviors is absolutely right. I'm seeing that in most different sectors. And and I think as, as human beings... How we buy and consume products uh, has probably changed forever. Absolutely, and it's uh, it impacts as well uh, how businesses as well buy because many businesses are going to go and uh, buy certain things that are to a certain degree as well usable for consumers, whether it's to supply their own. Uh, kitchen facilities with food and so on where all the employees go and get a snack or anything even all those different things there as well startups that have free drinks and food and so on and as well big corporations where they say yeah people have to be more healthier and then maybe maybe the corporation even has their own uh, health insurance company like for instance germany siemens has their own uh, health uh, insurance company subsidiary and other big brands as well and i think in uk as well some companies have that yeah and that really makes them more work people have to eat healthier but now uh, the logistics departments are uh, not going actually ordering it in the normal way because they know we can't get the stuff. They're maybe even looking how can we order the stuff somewhere where it's more reliable and using other kinds of supplies and even big retailers that are in food area, they're doing uh, supplies and delivery services and that, which is which is good. But as well, companies who usually would deliver stuff like desks and so on, they have, some of them have been very smart and have adjusted. When I'm working here with a desk from uh, designed by Swiss people who've got a company actually in Austria and they design these desks that are rising and you can uh, they can ship them everywhere around the world. They've, they're shipping them to the UK, to USA, Canada, everywhere. And it's so super. Within 10 minutes, you can set it up yourself. You've got everything in the box that you need. It is heavy, the stuff, to, <laughs> if it has to be taken up to a certain uh, level or so without any lifts or elevators. But otherwise, it is so great because you can adapt your way of working and employees are beginning to then say hey i have to adapt my work environment if i have to work from home and companies think okay uh but we have to ship the stuff to maybe a thousand employees but it's a thousand different addresses (laughs) it's different than if you're just shipping resources to like three locations at our offices and that's no problem and suddenly you've got homes and the homes are maybe in the countryside, maybe in the city or maybe somewhere where you can't even park a lorry of that ilk, uh, for instance. And that and it's, it just changes how people are doing business and drives as well the idea of which kind of businesses are now a risk 
as I said, B2C has a, mass, a substantial risk unless they're able to adapt and find a way to be better. And the same thing with B2B, because if B2B doesn't adapt to the change of mode of the clients, let's say you're a B2B business and you've got corporates who are your customers, suddenly your, your customers actually are not getting the stuff delivered to one big address where you can just send one big truck and you empty the whole thing at, at once. You have to deliver inside a city and you need smaller trucks. Oops, I haven't got small trucks. I can't deliver. Okay, then we order from somebody else. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> so in that example, it, it's, it's, it's up to the corporate um, to plug into that distribution and logistics network that has really been pioneered by Amazon in most countries where you've got all these self-employed small drivers that are flying around delivering all the parcels. You know, that's a great infrastructure that I'm seeing a lot of manufacturing companies even, um, you know, utilizing because to your point, they're being asked to send products out to isolated locations rather than shipping warehouse to warehouse. Exactly. And I think as well, the shipping companies, all these uh, service companies like DHL, uh, Parcel Force and all the different other services, UPS and so on, they're all innovating and trying to uh, as well improve the way of uh, pricing everything and how the whole thing is managed. For instance, the Deutsche Post, which is the owner of uh, DHL International and uh, all DHL and so on, they have added different kinds of services as well so that uh, if you're already doing business with them, you can even expand what you do. You can even cut your costs and still ship the stuff and have the track, whether you're selling uh, little cables for equipment and so on. You can still track and know, okay, the, the stuff really arrived at the parcel and uh, you can avoid as well the risk that usually happens. A fraud, of course, because people then say, oh, I never got it. They really got it. But if you can't track it, you can't prove it. And that's the thing. You have to adapt in business. And then you think, okay, if I want to buy this business, whether it's USA, Canada, UK, Germany, wherever, uh, hmm, are they really up to it? What would you say your experience when you're buying companies, let's say in Canada or in USA? What's your experience from there? So I've not acquired many companies in Canada as an individual, but uh, I've acquired tons and tons of them in the United States. Um, the, the U.S. is clearly the best market to uh, you know to do deals. You know, one for one reason, you've just got a phenomenal high number of businesses for sale. Um, it's between two point four, two point five million businesses today. Secondly, there's trillions and trillions of dollars in acquisition financing. Uh, you've got something in the U.S. called the SBA, and it's a loan program that's backed by the federal government. Where if you find a business that qualifies, the, uh, the, the SBA through a partner bank will give you up to 90% of the purchase price in very, very cheap, affordable debt to be able to buy that business and repay that loan between 10 and 25 years, depending on the type of business and whether real estate's involved. So uh, that's a massive source of rocket fuel for deals. And then also what you have in the States is you have the kind of the entrepreneurial culture where most business owners are highly seasoned in terms of seller financing. So most business owners realize that they're not going to get all of their money up front when they sell their business. And what you've also got in the States is you've got the, the kind of the big baby boomer problem. So in the United States, every single day, According to the Wall Street Journal, there are 10,000 baby boomers retiring and lots of them own small businesses. So there are thousands of businesses every day coming to market to be sold because people want to retire. And if you go back 10 or 20 years, it was very normal in America for the owner of a business to essentially hand it down to a son or daughter. So hand it down to the next generation. But we've seen a massive kind of shift in that over the last 10 to 20 years um, with the number of children that want to go to college and they want to be doctors and dentists and bankers and lawyers and all those different professions. They, they don't want to take over their parents' family business, whether it's in manufacturing or it's in retail or, or whatever sector it's in. So now you've got all of these sellers 
that they don't have an exit strategy. So they actually don't know what their plan is to sell their business. So if you combine all those factors, you, you, you've got people now looking to sell that don't have a plan. You've got all this financing that's available. Uh, you've got that that entrepreneurial seller financing culture plus millions of businesses for sale. The United States is, is just a phenomenal place to do deals. And, and what's great about the U.S. is they let non-Americans buy businesses. It's phenomenal. So there's a legal structure in the United States called an LLC, which is a limited liability corporation. And it's a legal structure that allows non-US citizens to become owners and shareholders of businesses. Um, and, and it's a very tax efficient structure as well to own a business and generate cash flow. So uh, combine all of those things, America is the place to do deals. And how would you compare it now with the UK, where you've as well been quite active? Yeah, so the, the UK is also a very, very strong market. Uh, obviously, there's not the same number of businesses for sale. There's about 450,000. Um, you've got lots and lots of financing in the UK. Uh, quite recently, the UK has introduced a new financing scheme called CBILS, C-B-I-L-S. It stands for the Coronavirus Business Interruption Loan Scheme. But you're able to use that financing to acquire companies. So it allows most businesses to get 25% of their annual revenues in cash as a very, very low long-term um, debt loan. It's it's a um, it's a bank loan, but it's it's underwritten by the UK government. So that's providing another kind of source of funding to be able to do those deals. You, you've not quite got the the seller financing culture that you've got within mm. the US, uh, although that's started to change quite radically over the past one to two years. Um, you know, the last couple of deals that I bought in the UK. Uh, I paid less than half of the purchase price up front using external financing. The rest was was seller financing or deferred consideration, as we call it. And you've obviously not got as dominant a baby boomer factor or, or a lack of an exit strategy. But, you know, there are a lot of people that, that own businesses that are looking to retire. You know, the baby boomer issue in the States uh, was generated after the Second World War, and and we've got similar things in the uh, in the UK as well. Yeah, absolutely. Because when you think of it as well, especially in Europe, uh, uh, it's as well that whether it's the First or Second World War, often there were the women there, but uh, often the men were missing. Either they were had been killed, or they were somewhere in prison, or had been captured somewhere, or whatever or had other kind of uh, situation where, of course, uh, this baby booming isn't so existent as uh, we'd have it in the U.S., where actually not the late uh, introduction of the United States into the war um, protected many, many generations as well, much better than, uh, for instance, in Europe, because, of course, everywhere bombs were flying around and so on. And, and yeah, survival rate wasn't that high when you think of it, even even different kind of uh, places where people were maybe fighting or in a home guard and all the other areas, the risks as well uh, were much higher. And yeah, that's something that has as well an impact at a longer term on uh, generations, on, on the baby booming and other kind of things. And on the other hand as well, of course, uh, I think Europe has had a very long time uh, where it's been very traditional and conservative of being an employee and only a few people over generation over generation have been self-employed. And that's that's quite a difference than usually. But now, of course, we have many people who are already past the transition of being a freelancer and saying, I want to have my own business, actually having people working for me. And that's a totally different mindset and a different challenge as well when you suddenly are responsible for a whole set of people who have yeah. families as well. And you may be as well increasing the amount, the volume of your turnover, your deals, your responsibilities as well towards tax and other things. And think of all the stuff that's happening with Corona and so on. You just need to have a few months of lockdown and suddenly businesses that seem to be healthy just crash because uh, even after lockdown, people are not buying in that quantity. I uh, was today at the at the local pool 
and the restaurant nearby was just em nearly empty and the pool itself had just maybe eight people in this huge public pool we've got all this stuff for kids and everything it was uh, not the best weather but it was still partly sunny partly sh uh, cloudy really nice day to be outside there wasn't really much happening there And that affects as well other businesses around who are uh, dependent on people actually going there. And even if you go to a doctor or physiotherapist or any place as well that uh, maybe has been always thought, well, they must be busy and so on because they're the health system and so on. But certain areas, they, they just haven't got any business because people are just saying, I, I don't need to go now. I can move it pass it, do something different. Maybe I do something different, maybe go and do my own exercise and so on, maybe keep a bit more fit to avoid having to go there. And that has as well, of course, a pink impact as well on the companies who supply these kind of businesses as well. So it's a whole food chain and eventually gets impacted. Uh, and as you say, it's, it's, there are opportunities as well, even when you're buying business or helping people, the buyer and the seller to get together And to find a good uh, arrangement where both are being happy, the business is going to survive and grow. And instead of having a, a deal where maybe you make some money, but in the end, the whole thing collapses after two, three years latest, that you don't want because it then tarnishes your own reputation. Yep. So you, you won't later on, even after five or 10 years, say, hey, uh, this deal I did and this deal and, it did, and everybody knows, oh yeah, that company is existing and it's even grown, it's doubled and it's huge and It's awesome. And I say, wow, you did that deal. Oh, now I must do business with you because you definitely know what you're doing. <laughs> and that's, that's trust and actually that builds because you, you can always call the people and ask them, hey, how was it? How was it to work with, with Carl? And they say, wow, it was awesome and uh, everything worked well. No headaches. Because I think when you're buying businesses and you're not following all these things, and especially when you're applying your experience, you are actually helping them to avoid all these pitfalls that can really hurt you. Uh, not only financial-wise, but as well emotionally and stressful, can be even bad for your health. What would you say? Sorry, can you repeat the question, Christian? You um, yeah, um, the question was when you when you look at all the different things uh, that you usually can do wrong when you're buying a business, and you yourself you've got so much experience how to avoid these pitfalls and those things uh, that eventually can cost you money, can cost your health, and so on. Especially as a buyer or even a seller, or both parties might might get even into trouble. Both sides. Yeah. Um, you, with your experience and knowledge, how to do these things with the many deals that you've done, um, you're saving actually people a lot of time, money, and pain, or? Yeah, so there's a number of things, actually. So the, the first one is on any deal that you do, um, my best advice is, you know, don't do the due diligence yourself. So what a lot of first-time business buyers do is they'll find a business and They, they will do all of the due diligence just to try and save a few thousand pounds or euros or dollars in due diligence fees. So don't do that. Get the pros involved. So get an accountant and a lawyer to run the fine tune over the business just to make sure that it's a really safe business to buy. And, and what's interesting about that is if you develop relationships with those advisors, in a lot of cases, you can get them to do the due diligence for you on a contingency fee basis. So the business pays the fees when you close the deal. So that's my first piece of advice. The second piece of advice would be that really, when you buy a business, you absolutely have to grow it. There's no point buying a business uh, without having any strategic intention to really grow it. And, and a lot of the businesses that you'll find, especially with the older generation, is they, they don't do a lot of marketing. So they'll rely on repeat customers and a lot of word of mouth referrals. And, and quite often I see entrepreneurs getting into these deals and they just sit back and think, well, you, you know, I don't need to do any marketing. The business is, is continuing to generate revenue. But when you plug in marketing tactics, whether it's social media or or whether it's other partnerships and affiliates. Um, it's What I see a lot happen is, is entrepreneurs go in and they don't grow the businesses as much as they could do or should do. Uh, because the more you grow a business, the more profitable it's going to be, the more money you're going to make, 
when you sell that business. And then the third mistake I, I see people making, and I talked about this earlier, is they go and buy businesses in a sector that they don't understand. And that's crazy. That is absolutely crazy. So, you know, if you've worked for IBM um, as an engineer, why would you go and buy a restaurant? You know, you know nothing about the restaurant industry. You can't add any value to it. Uh, you don't have a network you can plug in. Um, you know, why, why do that? Go and buy something in your lane. Go and buy something in a place that you can add value to, you can add your experience to, your skills, your network, your passion. So those are the three biggest mistakes that that I see people making. Yeah, absolutely, definitely, and and that's I think as you said as well before, it's so important to follow that, all these things. So it was actually great having you here on the show, and Carl, looking forward to maybe next time when we chat as well about other topics around business and buying small and medium sized businesses, whether it's in UK, USA, Canada, and other places. Yeah, that was a great time talking with you about all these things. Thank you very much, Christian. Great to be on the show. Great too. Well, that's all for today's episode of The Growth Zone. Thank you for listening. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or Spotify so you never miss an episode. Plus, if you haven't got your signed copy of the marketing book, stop by on our website at book.prmediareach.com and hurry because the reserve batch of signed books are almost sold out. So, the address is bookprmediareach.com I'll repeat, book.prmediareach.com book.prmediareach.com